In chapter six, Harry Vernette Rhodes shares the realities of working with her guides and people from the other side. Why would she trust what she hears from these unseen entities? She tells a few examples, each where she was just instructed to show up somewhere at the insistence of a teacher. One very touching example is when her father stops her, tells her to change her plans right now, go up those stairs in that office building over there, and then just go in and ask the guy what he thinks of spiritualism. She makes it very clear that her feelings about this were about as good as you'd feel if somebody told you to go do such a thing. It was weird, but by then she was used to weird. In the end, this discussion saved the man's life because he was about to commit suicide. You do this a few times and always getting such results explains why she bothered to listen to these guides. One of the funniest concepts in her book is an amusing tale of how her friend managed to get rid of a demanding pompous fellow who kept showing up. Just because somebody is dead does not mean they're interesting. Chapter six, part one of Teachers and Helpers. For years, I've been instructed daily by my father and other helpers and teachers. They tell me where I'm most needed and how to proceed with my work. Sometimes when I've planned the day, I've been told to do just the opposite, and never once have the teacher's plans failed to be better than mine, for they always seem to know where the need is the greatest. Actually, I think everyone has some sort of leading like this in his daily life, especially if he wants to be used to help and to heal. He will be shown where to go and when. To some intuitive people, the teacher appears as a voice or even as a visible figure as they are to me. To other people, the message may come as a hunch, a quick intuition, or a conviction which cannot really be defended logically. Yet, they have learned to trust. I believe that if we learn to listen intently and regularly, our path is made plain to us, whether by teachers or some other means. Several times, my teachers have sent me to strange places wherever I have arrived just in time to save serious trouble or possibly untimely death. One case was that of a little girl who fell against a sharp corner of a stove, just as I reached her house. Her father picked her up. She was limp, and he thought she was dead, although I think she was merely unconscious. I put my hands on her, felt the healing power pulse strongly through my hands. In a few moments, she woke up, except for a large bump on her head. Was it coincidence that she recovered so promptly? No one can really say any more than we can actually determine if a medical doctor's patient would have lived had he not intervened. In either case, the healer was used at the right time. Another time I was downtown when my father told me to go up a strange stairway instead of taking the car for home. When I reached the third story, I found a doctor's office. The name on the door was unknown to me. I was told to go in, and then I was surprised to find a doctor who I had met at a friend's house some years before. I had totally forgotten him until that moment. He asked me what he could do for me. Uh, I was embarrassed, as I did not know why I was there. I sat down and surprised myself by asking, Doctor, do you know anything about spiritualism? He jumped up, and he grasped my hand, and he said, Why, bless your heart. How did you ever come to ask me that? I was reared in a spiritualist family way down east, and both my father and mother were strong believers. And then he began to cry and told me that he had strayed far from his better self and had grown so discouraged that he had just decided to end his confused days. That day, as soon as the ladies whom I had met at the door were gone. He opened a table drawer and showed me the loaded pistol, which he had ready. We had a long talk, and he said he would start all over again and try to follow his mother's teaching. I saw him once years later, and he appeared to be well and happy. Maybe if I were a more sensitive person, I would have felt his need without the aid of the teacher. Sometimes I think that we keep invisible connection, almost like spider web thread through all we have ever known, and that we should be able to hear one another's calls of distress. To be sure the connection is wireless, 
more a matter of wavelength or vibration. But in some real, though tenuous fashion, we are all bound together and can be used hourly to help one another. In the same way our joys are quickly passed out to others and theirs to us, our day may be lifted by unseen hearts. In my experience, the unseen teachers usually make the connections and prompt my activities. A number of times, teachers have taken me to someone who has just swallowed a dose of poison, intentionally or otherwise, and I have been used to save the life or the reason of the distracted individual. Now, none of us wants to accept blind orders, and when a command or a request comes from the other side, we are likely to ask ourselves if we imagine the reliability of the source, especially if the order is one that we do not relish. I have plenty of sympathy for Mrs. Maitland's refusal to accept advice, which seemed to come from my father about not boarding a certain train that we talked about in chapter five. It is a good thing, I believe, to ponder this matter of reliability consistently, for after all, we are endowed with reasoning minds for the purpose of weighing evidence. But after sufficient experience, a time comes when one knows that a given suggestion or a particular teacher is reliable. I had to learn obedience to these reliable instructors as one learns to be ever more acutely aware of the inner promptings that we know as our voice of conscience and to follow its lead. At first, I was taught to follow the practical sort of direction that my father would tell me, such as which town to go to for music pupils or advise me to stay home on certain days. It was relatively easy to listen to him because he had always had a good reason for every demand that he made. Nevertheless, it seemed that I just had to have it pounded into my head that I was being trained for an ever-increasing service and that I must accept and fulfill whatever conditions were given to me because they were necessary to my development. To many people, this fact of daily life is plain enough. It is part of their religious commitment. But I had to learn again and again. In the early days of my experience with teachers, beginning about 1905, when we moved to Painesville, Minnesota, I had to make a success of my music teaching because I helped to support a large family. And after I, I was left alone as the sole support for my own five children, it was even more important for me to succeed. My classes were in small towns, and I taught all day in one town, and then took the night train for the next town. The towns had vastly different personalities. One town was all Scandinavian, and most all the inhabitants were Lutheran. The next day, I taught in a town, which was about equally divided between Irish and the Germans, and practically every person there was Catholic. The following day, my work was in a Yankee town, mostly of the people of New England, and they were Congregationalist, Baptist, and Methodist. And so it went. In each town, the manner of living and the habits of thought were so diverse that it required an entirely different mode of teaching music to reach the pupils and to obtain the best results. One morning while I was driving through a section of the woods, I stopped the horse to ask my father, who was near me, why it was necessary for me to have such varied work. And he answered that, this experience was training for my future service because the more important task to come, I would be brought in contact with all types of people who held many divergent points of view. And he said, in order to meet folks on their own ground and to understand their needs, you must learn to adapt yourself to their way of reasoning and be able to make them understand truth from their own ground. Now, recall this was in 1905, several years before she started her healing work. This advice from her father, Henry, is one of those wonderful statements that apply equally to our lives today. Speaking your truth, no matter how authentically or helpful you want to be, is rarely effective. Henry's wisdom is to focus on the goal of how to get your message heard, not just saying what you are thinking, no matter how wise you are. To really interact with others, you have to be willing to understand this situation from their point of view and to recognize what that person needs in this moment. Only then can you phrase your ideas in a way that will mean something to that other person. 
Okay, so now Harry continues. Although I rebelled at, at the time at having to live so many lives in all these different communities, I now treasure every bit of that experience. With my patients, the important thing is to give each one just the needed light. And to accomplish that, I have to be able to put myself in the patient's place. Sometimes I have to proceed very slowly, just a comment here and there and a question, but other persons lap up all the knowledge they can get. One of the hardest tests of obedience I had was this. My best and largest music class was in Bruton, Minnesota. I hope I pronounced that right. A town of 500 near Painesville in the center of Minnesota. I taught there for four or five years. The pupils were ambitious and tried very hard to please me. They even arranged a surprise for me by renting a vacant barber shop and fixing it up as a studio to make my work easier. We were planning to give another recital and had made some preparations when I heard my father speaking. Next week, when you go to Bruton, tell them that this will be your last trip. Of course, I felt dismayed and heartsick to think of the pupil's disappointment. Father went on to tell me to write to the lady who had been asking me to come to Kimball Prairie and tell her I would be there to teach the following week. It seemed to me extremely foolish to give up a sure class for one which I knew nothing. However, I had learned to trust my father for he had never once deceived me. No one can imagine how surprised I was the next week when I reached Bruton. Of my 21 pupils, only two came for lessons. All the rest sent word that they or their folks were sick, or they were moving from town, or in one case, the horses had died and there was no way of getting to town. The following week, I arrived at Kimball Prairie, and I was met by a lady who said I would have to stay with her this week. The woman who had originally invited me was away helping her sick mother. At her house, we had lunch and were talking about my next morning's work when I saw my father standing there. Being among total strangers, I hesitated to speak of his presence, but he insisted. Finally, I said, you may think me crazy, but my father, who is on the other side, wants me to have you ask your father if he remembers the night they were caught in a bad storm and he made sheets. I did not know a thing about this woman's father, nor about her, and was surprised when she said that she would phone her father and ask him about it. He was so excited that he came over as soon as possible to see me. It seems that when I was about five years old, my father had sold sewing machines and her father had bought cattle. On one very stormy night, the two men were both caught in the country and could not get home because of the rain. They stayed all night at a farmhouse where the lady had no sewing machine. She was reluctant to letting these men stay at her house until my father offered to sew a bolt of cloth into sheets for her. She bought a sewing machine before they left. That visit had also become the basis of a lasting friendship between the two men. I also discovered that this woman, the one I was staying with, had taken her first piano lesson from my mother when I was just a small child. For some months, I had a very successful class in that town and many people became intensely interested in the story of my father's message. Finally, the people asked me to arrange some meetings there so that they could learn to better understand the truth of life's continuity after death. Sometimes the helpers from the other side use us in their good work when we do not even realize that we are contributing to anything. I believe we have to be willing to be used for good any place, any time, if the helpers can call us in. An incident occurred in the winter of 1918, which illustrates this fact. I'm reading this from my notebook. February 14th. Today, while treating, I heard whistles blowing at an unusual hour. A feeling of fear and danger came over me, and then I saw a, a fire in a large, low building. 
like a factory or a room with many posts which supported the ceiling. I could see the burning timbers and hear the crackle of the flames. Do not know what it means as there is no report of fire. My next entry said, February 15th. At 7 a.m., I saw the morning paper with the headline, 100 children burned, 41 bodies recovered. This was a fire that occurred at a nunnery in Montreal. At 10 o'clock, I saw the same headline clairvoyantly, and I heard a voice say, we showed you the fire yesterday when this took place. And then the helpers explained that they were drawing force from me to help those babies. It seemed that energy, perhaps what those in the East call prana, certainly some essence of vitality, can thus be borrowed on some occasions. Sometimes the scenes shown to me by the helpers can be very trying in other ways. Late in March 1918, so this was during World War I, I was shown a battlefield in France and my son Harry walking among the wounded although he seemed ready to fall himself because of a wound in his leg. Nevertheless, he was waving his arms and running forward ahead of the others. It was months later in July before I had a letter from Harry that mentioned that on that March day, he had uh, stopped a piece of shrapnel and was recovering in the base hospital. Some teachers come only once with a special message. A few are hard to follow, they talk like erudite academics who are difficult to follow in daily life. Some are just talkative old biddies, wanting attention and feeling the importance that comes with telling someone else what to do. For many years, I had luncheon every day with my good friend, Mabel Falstrom. One such etheric lecturer came daily for quite some time with his long, pointless ramblings. He insisted on being heard before anyone else, and he would not leave. For a while, Mabel took down notes on his lectures. She could hear them as well as I did, although he did not come to her unless I was present. Apparently, certain people tune into specific wavelengths better than others. A good deal like radio stations have their own wavelengths. Unfortunately, I had the right wavelength for this erudite bore. Here was an example of the operation of the law of attraction. I knew nothing about this law of attraction when I first took up the pencil to get messages from my father. If I had, I might have been more cautious. This was an early attempt before I realized when seeking contact with those on the other side that we are open at the points of our weaknesses, whether mental, emotional, physical, or spiritual. Whatever flaws are in our bodies or characters, can all too easily become opening for the individuals with similar flaws. Once an entity comes through, they can be painfully difficult to send away. I learned this from treating the cases of people who have been possessed. I think this erudite lecturer entered my sphere of influence, so to speak, through my former regret in not having had any university education. In the case of the talkative old lecturer, we were lucky. Eventually, Mabel gave up trying to be polite that he get off the line and peremptorily ordered him out of the house. He never bothered us again after that. We decided he had been a wordy old codger in his classroom on earth and had never gotten the recognition he craved. So that now from the other side, he still clamored for attention. I used to wonder if he even realized that he was dead. Subscribe to make sure you know when I post part two of this chapter, which tells the details of her interactions with her teachers and helpers and a little bit about them, and also what she has learned of psychic protection for anyone who actually wishes to try out automatic writing themselves or other forms of psychic contact.